In this episode of Negative Modifier, we'll be playing the game Delta Green. Delta Green, by design, tackles various mature themes that may be uncomfortable or triggering for listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Hey, it's Charlie, Negative Modifier's Game Master. First off, thank you for giving us a listen. As always, expect something horrible to happen to the players. If you're a fan, support us by leaving a review on iTunes. If you hate the show, consider doing it anyway and enjoying the fact that you've inflicted us on someone else. For the most up-to-date news on the podcast, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. And with that... It's December 22nd, 1998. So we're going to open up on a Blackhawk helicopter as it slowly descends towards 12 mobile trailers arranged to some kind of base camp or headquarters below you. As you descend, you can make out numerous armed guards patrolling around this makeshift compound, some in Humvees, most on foot. As you are descending, give me a alertness. 91 out of 20 failure. 42 out of 20 failure. 36 out of 20 failure. It's windy, there's lots of snow, maybe some of the wind kind of buffets the Blackhawk you're in some. Being in a helicopter in a blizzard, not a great place to be, especially where this all started off. This is a long day of flying from where this all started at the Needless Airport in Nevada. You were not expecting to find yourself quite literally descending into a blizzard when you started this day off in 60 degree heat. As you drop closer to the ground, your headset kind of crackles with some radio, and one of your black suit wearing, overcoat dressed guard says, All right, we've begun our final descent. We're going to do a final uh, confirmation of who you are. Please identify yourself and state your project involvement for the record. Hello, my name is Chad. I am playing Major Aideen Dempsey. Aideen Dempsey reporting, U.S. Air Force physicist. My name is Alex, and I will be playing Dr. Cornelia Medlow, Ph.D. She is the Project Pluto acoustician and solid-state physicist. You can kind of like maybe make some staticky sounds of scribbling out. All right, next. Hello, I'm Dylan. I'm going to be playing Isidore Schreiler, Ph.D. in... All right, good. And then as the fourth member of the research team is about to speak up, the helicopter is rocked by a strong gust of wind. And the person taking attendance goes, ah, it's good enough. Yeah, you all make the list. All right, prepare for landing. Everyone brace yourself. This may be a little bit rough as we come in. Helicopter descends the rest of the way, touches down, and you find yourself in a makeshift airfield. Around you, you can see a few other Black Ops helicopters, but you're then whisked away to this kind of base camp thing you saw in the air. You're rapidly kind of escorted inside to what appears to be a briefing room of some kind. As you enter, you see a table with two people seated at it, and then and at kind of the head of it, you see three people, one of which you recognize as your team lead, Dr. Bimmel. The man who appears to be in charge, an almost hawk-looking African-American man, gestures for you to sit down at the table and goes, please have a seat, and thank you for joining us on such short notice. Take a seat. All right. Clarification. So we can recognize Dr. Bimmel. Yes. And who else? No one else. No one else. Okay. I kind of take a quick scan of the table, give a little bit of a head nod to Dr. Bimmel, take my seat. Dr. Marlow? I'll just kind of walk in and wave to everybody really quickly and then just kind of just take a seat. Good evening and thank you for joining us on such short notice. Welcome to Alabama. Willis, Alabama, to be precise. You may refer to me as Agent Harris. I will be the man in charge of this whole little thing we're doing here. I do hope you had a somewhat pleasant flight. Gestures at the man you don't recognize to his left. This is Major James Farrell. He will be in charge of recovery here. He's a slightly graying white dude dressed in Air Force uniform, kind of nods at this. Obviously, you're familiar with Dr. Bimmel here. I'm sure you have questions, and please hold them until we can get through this. Given the sensitive nature of what we're doing here, we have to review some basic safety procedures. Compartmentalization is key here. There are three clearances at work. You are clear for Project Pluto. Do not discuss anything that is not immediately part of your work here with anyone else. Not everyone here is clear for Project Pluto, and not everyone has the same clearance you have. And with that said, welcome to Weather Watcher. If it is not pertinent to the ongoing work we're doing here as part of Weather Watcher, do not discuss it. This is not a social outing. This is not a chance to network or make friends. We are in the middle of an exceedingly important research endeavor, and time is of the essence. I have gestures at you. A word of note, all personnel will be required to be accompanied by security agents at all time. This is non-negotiable. Am I making myself clear? Yes, yes, sir. Crystal. Excellent. Moving on. We have a security perimeter established 
in roughly three kilometers in all directions from roughly where you're standing here. Center point is the town of Willis. Nobody enters, nobody leads. All major roads are blocked, and the perimeters are being watched by National Guard soldiers and the 20th Special Forces. They are trained, they are highly effective, and they are not cleared for anything that may or may not happen here as part of Weather Watcher. Am I understood? Yes. You are understood. Now, quick question, Agent Harris. Is the reason why there is a perimeter currently disclosed or i was about to get to that as i said please save all your questions for the end we've not had to deal with reporters yet we provided the nearby towns of huntsville and birmingham with some cover stories nothing especially dramatic has happened yet here at the epicenter we do not anticipate anyone braving the storm at this late hour to investigate to your question though kind of gestures at dr bimmel who steps forward there has been an event an event Dr. Bimmel kind of nods at this. Yes. At approximately 1.43 December 2nd, so today slash yesterday, depending on how you tell time, but officially today, an area of approximately 10 kilometers diameter experienced a sudden and unexpected drastic drop in temperature. The temperatures dropped from a typical low of 3 degrees Celsius to negative 30 degrees Celsius, where it remained for four hours, roughly 1.43 a.m. to sunrise at roughly 5.55 a.m. The snowstorm you're experiencing outside began the day before on December 21st and has been blanketing the area and has made identifying the exact epicenter almost impossible. The storm has been the worst recorded storm in this area of this type on record. We have files prepared detailing the local weather patterns that we will be providing after this briefing. Locally, this is known as a Jack Frost weather event. To put it in layman's terms, it's just a simple localized cold front. This one, as noted, given the extreme drop in temperature, is a little bit different. You have been brought here to analyze the various strange energy readings we have found in the local area. There has been also several strange eyewitness reports that indicate some type of energy reading or energy fluctuation of some kind. Again, we have handouts and information to provide at the end of this. Engineer steps forward at this point and kind of takes control back of the briefing. I was the first person on site this morning, roughly 6.30 a.m., or whatever happened last night transpired. The only thing we know for sure is that everything is dead. All the inhabitants of the local town of Willis, more than 100 people, and every animal, bird, bug, and even worm within the perimeter we've established is dead. Frozen to death inside or outside of a building. And it pauses. Now is an acceptable time to ask questions. Agent Harris, you're telling me that there was a flash freeze and we now have a hundred plus dead Americans, as well as the local fauna. He nods at this. Indeed. To make it stranger, upon my initial investigation, I found that people, regardless of location, comfortably heated rooms are not all frozen to death, all the same, and remained frozen at least five hours after what happened. When you say frozen, were there signs of immediate kind of condensation and immediate freezing of? water vapor or are we talking about like someone was playing red light green light and it chuckles at this a little bit and shakes his head no no i do indeed mean frozen frozen as in body temperatures down near zero during your helicopter descent you may have seen various trailers six of the 12 facilities we have here are morgues housing the various dead recovered from willis part of why you're here dr schuler is to Try and establish what happened. Perform an autopsy, if you will. Obviously, given your normal areas of research, you have the clearance for such an event as such as this. And obviously, this is not just some cold snap. Yeah, no, of course not. Um, I imagine we have the proper equipment already on site. He nods at this. Yes, we'll be getting to that shortly. Um, Dr. Bimmo is going to fill you in and get you acquainted with once this was over. If we're all comfortable with what I've talked about so far, we can continue the briefing. Any further questions about the immediate findings I witnessed upon my discovery? So when you say close to zero, did everyone just hit close to zero? Like, regardless of like size, like did like bigger gentlemen and smaller gentlemen or just in general, did they all just same thing, just close to zero, regardless of like body mass? Because that just seems odd. Again, doctor, that's why you all are here. This is indeed odd. And perhaps there are survivors, 
I did not find them, but every dog, hamster, human, mouse, rat, or bug I came across, dead. Any structural damage? Because temperatures dropping that low immediately should have caused any kind of structural damage to the buildings nearby. Was there any structural damage as part of it, or was this just people? I did not notice anything immediately upon my investigation, but given the blizzard conditions, and I will admit to not being an architect by any trade, I could not fully confirm this. I did not notice anything obvious, but if you feel the need to investigate, Willis, we can arrange some type of team to escort you or conduct the investigation on your behalf. We have several Blue Fly personnel standing by for such an occasion. But we have more important things to attend to first. We have autopsies. We have some immediate questions we need answered before we broaden our area of interest. Any other questions? This is my last one, Agent Harris. Now, you're saying that the victims, the the townsfolk, they were frozen five hours after the flash freeze. Have they thawed out or have they remained at a state of near freezing? As a standard autopsy procedure, we've chosen to keep them in a refrigerated state. In theory, given the fact that some of them were found in warm rooms, they should no longer have been frozen. Are there still bodies out? We believe we got all of them, but I cannot confirm we rounded up everyone. Hmm. Did we have any other operations going on in the area? Kind of raises an eyebrow at this. You are not cleared for such an answer. I will say that we are not aware of any other circumstances that may have caused this in the immediate area, though. I don't think I have any other questions. And nods at this. Very good. Obviously, with the strange weather phenomenon in place, we established the perimeter. As far as they know, they are assisting the Air Force on a classified mission of some kind. Thankfully, between the storm and the National Guard, we successfully turned away most people who tried to come through. We do have two people detained here at HQ that refuse to be turned away. There may also be a small chance that the local deputy was called prior to their detainment. They're here for questioning if you wish to speak to them. And Deputy Dawson has not made his presence known, at least at the perimeter, just yet. Given the secretive nature of the work we'll be conducting here, and the wide variety of unknowns, we have three layers of official cover story provided. Layer one is that a truck transporting nuclear materials went off the road and that this is a recovery and public safety cleaning operation. This is what the perimeter has been told to tell the outside. The second layer of the cover story is that a military satellite has fallen out of orbit. This is what the perimeter thinks is actually going on and what they were told. If for some reason they see something or suddenly start to doubt this, you are allowed to tell them that we are actually here recovering an aircraft load experimental technology that went down. This is all you can admit to the perimeter if they see too much or start to ask too many questions. If anyone sees through these layers, please contact an AFOSI security officer and they will handle it from there. Am I understood? Yeah. Yeah. Understood. Excellent. All that brings us to now. Shortly after my arrival, the perimeter and HQ was established, and I've taken control of the situation. Shortly after that, we're joined by Project Moondust pilots and pararescue men, gestures at Master Sergeant Jacob Hardy. And the final piece of the puzzle was your arrival. I'm sure you have questions. I'm sure that Dr. Bimmel's work for you to embark on starts to step back some. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask if they pertain to me. If they involve recovery of some kind, please direct them towards the major here and... As always, your direct superior is Dr. Pimmel. Secrecy is of the utmost importance here. This is a closed investigation and research project. As you know, given the exotic nature of the work you do, secrecy is key, and we do not want this leaking to outside sources. I am requesting that all research done that involves the outside world be minimal and does not expose the events that have taken place so far. The longer we can keep this site contained and unknown to the rest of the world, the easier our job will be. Am I understood? Understood. Very good. Before we break, do you have any questions for me or the major here? At the moment, I can't think of anything, but we, you will be readily available for contact. Am I correct in this or? Yes, we are all in this together, I suppose, is the way of thinking of it. I have my duties to attend to, and I'd prefer not to be updated on every aspect of the research you're about to conduct. That's what Dr. Bimmel is here for, but if it's something to do with security of some kind or some larger topic, please bring it to my attention to one of my agents. The fastest way of contacting me will obviously be through your security detail. I'm ready to go see what, what killed these folks. He nods at this. Excellent. Dr. Bimmel, the researchers are yours, and 
He and the Major kind of get up and walk out. The two people at the table kind of nod and also follow him out. You see two men dressed in the kind of same black suit, black overcoat look that was with you on the uh, helicopter. Settle themselves into folding chairs in the corner of the room and nod at you. Dr. Bimmel steps forward. I have some immediate information you probably should review before we get into the larger topic at hand here. Throw several files down the table. Please peruse at your leisure. I pick up one of the handouts and start leafing through it, checking out its contents and whatnot. Dr. Bimmel, it's a pleasure to see you again, or at least it's a pleasure to see you doing well or healthy, I would imagine. She nods at this. Yes, it's, I suppose, good to be in the field at this point. The paperwork you're slid across is kind of a collection of uh, low-frequency readings. Low-frequency detections. Submarine sensors. At about 1.43 a.m. Central Time, U.S. Navy submarines reported detecting a brief spike in extremely low-frequency radiation at a frequency around 13 hertz. Navy ELF communications stations reported the same 1.43 a.m. spike. Those are powerful and penny 15 to 60 kilometers in length, built to broadcast through seawater to receivers on submarines. No ELF transmitter reported sending such signals. Human resonance sensors. At weather research stations around the world, devices called human resonance sensors analyze extremely low frequency waves caused by lightning. Every weather station with a Schumann sensor detected two brief ELF surges separated by only a couple of seconds. Their cause has not been established. Sensors then detected a series of surprisingly powerful surges that implied a series of powerful lightning strikes. Identifying the source, it is typically very difficult for Schumann sensors to identify an ELF signal with a lightning strike that caused it. There are about 50 lightning strikes around the world every second. Each pulse of ELF radiation has such a long wavelength that it reaches around the globe many times, overlapping with itself until it fades. The ionosphere constantly resonates with ELF. But the timing and power of these surges made it possible to place their origin in the American Southeast. Some eyewitness reports. information about this so-called Jack weather event. Jack Frost weather events. Alabama winters are typically icy and wet, with heavy winds and lightning. Snowstorms, when they occur, typically are not seen until late in winter or even early spring, usually around March. Interplay between the easterly jet stream and the polar vortex cause cold snaps across the eastern U.S. every year. So-called Jack Frost. Highly localized cold snaps. They arise in the region around Willis and Russellville. They usually last no more than a day, not long enough to freeze water courses. Their exact cause of Jack Frost events is unknown. Some meteorologists think that the geography channels Arctic blasts through Molten Valley and the Broad Cumberland Plateau's Warrior River Basin, but many others disagree. Willis and Russellville are located in the hill. 
hills south of Wheeler Lake, and nothing readily explains why they should receive Arctic blasts when the nearby communities of Muscle Shoals, Malton, and Decatur do not. And, strangely enough, some information about Blue Aura. About auroras. An aurora is caused by the interaction of electrons or other charged particles with the magnetosphere. A ground-level burst of high-energy radiation such as X-rays or gamma rays could explain the aurora over Alabama. But that is only a hypothesis. Hypothesis 1. X-rays caused the auroras. X-rays are generated by stars and other astronomical objects in nuclear decay in medical X-ray devices, and in particle accelerators. Most X-ray detectors were built to study astronomical sources. But X-rays do not penetrate the Earth's magnetic field, so those detectors are stationed on orbiting satellites. Others are built into larger devices that study nuclear processes. None were in position to detect X-rays at Willis. Hypothesis 2, gamma rays caused the aurora. Intense gamma ray bursts are generated by nuclear explosions and by lightning. Gamma ray detectors must be calibrated precisely to work at all and none were calibrated to pick up this emission. There was no nuclear explosion at the time of the Willis event. The pilots described a flash of blue-white light. They said it was not the same as lightning, although it was followed by lightning. Either way, the lightning was over within a few seconds. It could not have generated enough gamma rays to lose so many charged particles as to cause an aurora. Notes about blue auroras. A blue aurora forms when charged particles from the collision of solar wind with the magnetosphere drift far toward the surface of Earth. Interaction with atmospheric nitrogen causes the blue color rather than the better known green caused by interactions with oxygen, which is more prevalent higher up. The Willis Aurora does not start high and drift down, with the solar wind sparking green to blue through the atmosphere. It manifests near the ground. That is not possible. Either both pilots described it incorrectly or the event violates physics. So historically, there's never been a Jack Frost event like this that's been this lethal, correct? There's not something about, like indigenous peoples experiencing a catastrophic event or previous settlers dr Mill shakes her head at this N- no and i'm not sure i can speak for the indigenous people of the area but as far back as recordings of weather in the area stretch we do not have any record of something like this this has been especially brutal even if this was typical weather events the severity and the sudden onset and the localization of this magnitude is unprecedented. Hence, why we're involved. We believe there might be some type of device or technology of some kind at play here that might be worth recovering for further study. So this is primarily, if not just Willis, correct? Russellville has not reported any kind of fatalities? She takes her at this. No, as far as we know, it's located just to Willis and the immediate surrounding area. All areas are dealing with the blizzard, but... This extreme cold, this localization, did not seem to affect anywhere outside of the immediate radius. I have a question. Do we have a meteorologist on the team? You do not. Okay. Yeah, I'm a physicist. I, too, am a physicist. I mean, Alex, you're definitely an acoustic acoustics physicist. Yeah. Sound science. Yep. I kind of have astrophysics, and to understand astrophysics, I also kind of need to understand earth physics can you say that i might have a little bit of like general weather or meteorological understanding in my undergrad course i would say more importantly your air force so that would probably play into that more than your physics training necessarily so cool so i could probably understand stuff a little bit when it comes to weather reports and whatnot through my air force military science correct yeah, absolutely. And I'll even give you that. Based on what you're reading about Jack Frost weather events, like, yes, they seem to be a thing that happens in this general area, but like, this isn't a Jack Frost weather event. This is extreme cold. Like, this doesn't happen anywhere on Earth. This isn't how the basic laws of thermodynamics work. 
to have something cool off that quickly requires a very defined space and an open air town is not that. So I'm looking at the map here and something that quick, that intense, especially after five hours, should have created an ice layer around Crow Lake. She nods at this. Yes, the lake is not frozen at this point in time. Excuse me. Hold up. Did you just say it is not frozen? She looks at No. While it's cold enough for a blizzard, the lake has not been below freezing temperatures long enough to freeze the lake. It is still liquid. Was there any structural damage to areas nearby, though? A temperature to drop people close to zero degrees Celsius should have definitely caused some sort of, like, damage to the either pipes or something. She shrugs at this. As Agent Harris said, he did not observe anything. I have not been into town yet. I've not been here meaningfully longer than you have at this point. I'm relatively recent on the scene as well. One would assume some type of structural damage given the extreme temperatures has occurred. But also, it seems to just be, based on preliminary findings, the cold seems to have just primarily affected organic tissue, not anything, well, else. Yes, there's a blizzard going on, and that brings the temperature down to below freezing so that snow can occur, but that's not what caused the event. We believe the blizzard may be a byproduct of whatever happened, but the blizzard predates what we understand of the event so far. So, to clarify, we understand that there is one extinction event, basically. There hasn't been another. Like, these people did not die in waves. It was just... Have nuts. If you turn your attention to the eyewitness report, there was a burst of strange activity happening around 1.43 a.m. local. We assume whatever happened roughly around that time, but beyond that, nothing else of that nature has happened beyond ebb and flow of the blizzard. Again, referring to the eyewitness reports you were provided with, there was a blue aura, radio static, a variety of phenomena that speak to some type of energy event of some kind. The nature of both the flash, the electrical interference, and all other phenomena has obviously not been identified. Gesture's kind of wide at this point, and that's why you've been brought in. I wish I could be more enlightening on this, but we are researchers and we are here to, she kind of shrugs at this, having to say it out loud, research what is going on here. It's our job, after all. Visible white blue flash of white blue light. She nods at this, yes. No thunder. But then we have confirmed lightning flashes, about violet lightning flashes, and then this is where I'm a little stuck on. The Aurora Borealis or the Aurora that the pilots are describing. That doesn't that doesn't sound like an Aurora Borealis. Indeed. Most atmospheric events of that nature have a shifting nature. Rarely are they described as a corona. Do these pilots understand what an Aurora Borealis is, or is this just kind of a vague explanation for for that? She shrugs at this, kind of ponders for a second, and then says, Well, I can't speak to whether or not the pots have seen the Aurora Borealis personally. The concept is well enough known. I suspect that that's what they're choosing to describe it as. This is all weird. Unfortunately, this is all the eyewitness reports we have. Unfortunately, no one of the more discerning eye was here. They were, after all, flying a plane at the time. They were probably, well, a tad distracted by the freak weather event happening and flying over or through potentially a blizzard. Do we have a record of their altitude when they saw this? He shuffles some paperwork around. I do not have that handy at the exact moment, but based on their route flying from Memphis to Atlanta, one would assume they were at full cruising altitude at the time. Okay. And this is a three three kilometer radius? Give or take. Okay. 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 Like, I understand that Major A.D. and Dempsey will not understand it as like, oh, okay, cool, this event might have just been within like a three kilometer sphere and they were flying higher than it, therefore was not affected, but that's kind of where I as a player am approaching this or trying to understand this myself. Oh, ah, sure. So seeing that things are starting to lag some, she kind of like puts her palms on the table and pushes off and looks at you all and goes, I've had a few more minutes with the situation. I'll let you digest some and dig through the information amongst yourselves if you have any questions. Feel free to ask. We're all in this together. I have some topics I need to attend to. Once you've had a chance to settle in, we have bodies to autopsy, equipment to set up in hopes that whatever happened perhaps happens again, or that we can detect something in the atmosphere, and some detainees to question. 
I won't say who has to do what, but I suspect, Dr. Schuler, you'll have the most luck with the autopsies. But please take your time with the information you have provided. Talk amongst yourselves. Digest. Really get a handle on the situation, if you will, before diving into this. You have time, but also time is of the essence. I understand it is late. Kind of looks at her watch. It is almost 10 p.m., but I'm hoping to have at least part of this done before anyone turns into the night. I know it's ideal working conditions, but as Agent Harris said, time is of the essence. If you need me, I'll be in the trailer next door. I've just run the Slactus HQ. If you need any type of equipment, we have available to all of you two new Canon XL1 digital camcorders with wide angle lenses, plenty of batteries and digital video cassettes for said camcorders, one SR box, external low frequency spectrum analyzer, two portable spectrum analyzers for low frequency, two portable spectrum analyzers for high frequency, one small handheld light meter one small handheld ionizing radiation detector, a few high-speed computers to log and process any data you find, some field medical stations for quarantine in the case something terrible happens, and field laboratory tents with quarantine chambers for biological examination and chemical testing. We've also allocated two non-pressurized hazmat suits for each one of you. Entering to the morgue spaces requires, given that we don't know what's happening, hazmat suits. Am I understood? Yeah. I'll see what I can do with the bodies tonight before I settle in. As she gets up to leave and kind of pauses for a second, kind of gets real close, like leans over the table and whispers, between you and me, Agent Harris is not your friend. You haven't been here too long just yet, but there's something else going on here. As the man has described his job, he shouldn't have that much to do at this point in time. The blizzard's done most of his work, but he has men covering every inch of this place. I'm not saying he's your enemy, but if they're not any of your fellow research personnel, perhaps don't trust them. Kind of straightens up at that. Well, with that being said, doctors, I leave you to settle in. Hopefully we can make some meaningful progress and kind of nods and exit the trailer at that point. Well, I better get myself familiarized with some of this equipment. I haven't used one of these in a minute, but nonetheless, getting readings out is probably going to be key. Not the smartest idea to head out for a snowstorm at this hour, but hmm. we should find out what killed these people before we go traipsing off to see what's left. Do any of you want to come and attend the autopsy? I don't really know how to work these cameras, and it's probably a good idea to record it. Yeah, I can. Uh, I can work the camera just fine. Well, honestly, that's probably the most I could do at this hour. Yes, I could do a little bit of note taking and recording. If I recall, your name was Dr. Schuler, correct? It's been a minute, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's me. You can just call me Isidore, though. Isidore, all right. And then Dr. Merlo, it's good to see you again as well. See you too. Shall we get started? Before you kind of divide up, I guess I should have mentioned this. All of these tasks will take several hours to complete. Bimmel does want you, before you get a chance to sleep, to deal with, at least talk to the detainees, set up some type of equipment to kind of get further readings on the area, and. There are the autopsies to do. Is everyone going after the autopsy now, or is someone going to go off and do some of the other tasks while they're at it? Honestly, when it comes to autopsies, that's really not my field of study. Mixed in with a good tripod is going to do the work that I'm probably going to do. I'm a little bit more concerned about the sheer fact that a Jack Frost event just killed an entire an entire town. I want to get my readings, and I need more data on this. We're going to go off and set up equipment and do some general area checking around. I think that's going to be for the best. Does anyone know if this town has a Doppler station? Are Dopplers, like, used yet? Yeah, but this town would not have one. Okay. This is too small a town. Okay. So I will go ahead and uh, set up some equipment. This woman likes to count her statistics to get to sleep. Sure. I'll see you all tomorrow. I'm going to assume you two will take on this autopsy. Sure. All right. So we're going to grab stuff like the Geiger counters to measure... Radiation, all the kind of other various energy readout stuff you can carry? Yes, specifically low frequency detections or any kind of like low frequency stuff. Sure. I saw that you had given us a low frequency detection handout in the background materials. Yep, indeed. And so apparently with the Schumann sensors, they were unable to identify an ELF signal with a lightning strike that caused. I kind of want to see if I can find that information and kind of cross-reference it myself. And see if I can kind of get like a better sense of like where these lightning strikes are mixed in with just kind of the 
already available equipment for the area. Sure. So that will entail kind of venturing out some into the storm to set up gear around the localized area that will uh, require getting your Crow Lake some, like, I'd be out kind of in the snow at night. One of the security officers can go with you, though, to as an escort. Is that what you want to do? Yes. So upon kind of hearing you have plans, as two agents indicated by Harris earlier kind of get up and walk over, one of them introduces himself to you directly as Agent Lawrence, and he says, well, I guess we're going out into the snow, aren't we? I'll arrange for transport of some kind. Might be bumpy, but we'll get through it. It's only some snow. Other one kind of turns to the other two. My name is Agent Andrews. I guess we're going to go look at some bodies. Yes. Peachy. All right, Major Dempsey, you and Agent Lawrence head out into the snow. Agent Lawrence finds a Humvee of some kind you load off into it. Are you looking to kind of do research down by the lake? Are you kind of looking to just kind of start scanning the snow in the general area to see if there's anything around? What are you looking to do, I guess? Kind of what, what kind of path of what are you looking to kind of get into, I guess, for that? From the map, it looks like the Weather Watcher HQ and camp is a little bit north of Willis itself. Yes. Around here. Kind of immediately exiting the HQ and camp, do I, can I see any kind of signs of fauna? It's all blanketed in snow, yes, but all the fauna's still there. Like, the trees are dead for the winter. There's no green grass poking up throughout the okay. snow, but... All right. There's not been some, like, ecological disaster, as best you can tell, aside for winter has come and blizzard. I would imagine, just because it's a three-kilometer area... I want to try to see if we can get down to Crow Lake. It looks like there's a small path to the beachfront right there. Sure. That and also I can like take a quick look through Willis because if it's going through, it's a blizzard at night. I'm not going to see very much. Sure. I realize now. So I would like to head down to Willis and grab a water sample. Um, Willis is the town. You mean the lake? The lake, Crow Lake. Because from the map, it looks like there's an access way from Willis, the town center, into Crow Lake. Yeah, there's, I guess, an offshoot that gets near Willis, but I guess also the dot is Willis, not the word Willis. No, yeah, I'm looking at the dot. There's like a little town there and then what looks like a little access road. Yep. Oh, yeah, they'll get you down to it, definitely. You're going to Crow Lake to kind of collect some water samples and see what's there? Yes. All right. I assume you're going to take some readings while you're down there? I will be taking some readings, yes. I'm just going to assume, based on the giant list of gear you got, you took stuff like the Geiger counter and all the other kind of uh, scanning devices. Of those materials, I understand how a Canon camera works, a sure. quarter, and a Geiger counter. Everything else was like, cool, there's mystical science stuff. I'm pretty sure they do something really important, but <laughs> not to my brain. Sure. Yeah, so I guess let's dig into the gear real quick. So... The SR box is an extremely low frequency spectrum analyzer. It weighs about six kilograms. The two portable spectrum analyzers, they read super low frequency to microwave. There are 21 kilograms each. There's two portable spectrum analyzers that read high frequency to infrared. They are 22 kilograms each. The small handheld light meter, which is a visual light to ultraviolet light kind of just detector and tells you what spectrums are present. There's the small handheld ionization detector x-ray to gamma ray it's basically a geiger counter at that point that's all the stuff you're taking with you yeah all right so what are you going to start with you got to take some general just kind of area readings of the geiger counter what are the various kind of i want to say energy issues that might be here but i have a better way of phrasing it what potentially kind of anomalous spectral things are you looking for first i almost will actually you know what i would like to start looking more so for infrared as i'm going through i wanted to start monitoring like the infrared and everything else like that i understand that like infrared we are in the middle of a snowstorm if any kind of living thing is to still be around if i were to believe that literally every living thing died i should hopefully be able to spot some sort of heat signature somewhere and if there is some interesting phenomenon on the other side of the spectrum i should be able to find a heat sink like Inside the snowstorm, maybe there's going to be something where it's just like, wait, why is there like a black hole in that infrared sensor or in that infrared reading? That means that something is like sucking in the heating. So I want to sure. kind of look through as we pass from Weather Watcher HQ into Willis, because Willis right. is going to be where it's interesting for, for sure. Yes, yeah, so you're kind of heading southwest along the path from HQ to the town of Willis, correct? Correct. All right. Give me a. Science physics role. Hell yeah, I'm really good at that. 
but not today. <laughs> it rolled a 64 out of 60 percent failure. Oh. All right, so you don't find anything useful or no kind of numbers, no readings exactly, but that is data within itself. It's, there should be something here. You don't have a good way of kind of measuring that there should be something there, but as you kind of said, it's nature. There's heat. There should be some type of indications of that. Like, there should be maybe some animals, just some kind of generally warmer or colder spots, but, like, it's just winter covered ground like it's snow it's trees it's rocks maybe the equipment's busted or something you can't quite tell maybe it's recalibration or something but you're not finding anything kind of tangible or useful that you can kind of present as findings but also that's a finding in itself like something's up with that you just have no way of at this time at least measuring what's up with that if that makes any sense but to be just clear i am like despite me not immediately catching anything i'm recording everything that i'm coming across sure. just so yeah. that way i have an accurate thing to like look at yeah later just in case if like something i realize something yep the nice thing about equipment is you can write stuff down to analyze further later hell yeah all right any other stuff you want to try and scan for you got the geiger counter equipment with you, you want to check like radiation or something yeah let's check out radiation level another deep inherent fear that you've instilled in my gaming bones do i roll another physics for Radiation readings? Um, no. So Geiger counters are pretty easy to read. So this is actually it kind of pops up as pretty obvious. So, so from the snow, kind of just in the general area, you're finding slight traces of radiation. And it almost seems like it got blown. Like you're finding it all over the place. But also the closer you get to Crow Lake, the kind of eastern side of it seems to have an elongated kind of path of it into a little more concentration, almost like it got pushed by, almost like it got carried by the winds or something like that. Hmm. Okay, definitely writing that down. And it's elongated path carried by the winds. Does it have a specific direction? It goes east from the lake. It's not like a footpath. You have a heightened level of it going from the lake east. Okay, that's what you meant. Gotcha, gotcha. As I'm traveling from the Weather Watcher HQ to the town of Willis, the Geiger counter should slowly decrease. And it slowly increases. The slowly increases. The closer you get to the lake, the more it goes up. It's more concentrated around the lake itself, but also the most concentrated is kind of lake eastward. So looking at the map, it's kind of lake and to the right of the lake. Gotcha. Looking at my equipment, do I have rad suits? You do not have rad suits. You do have hazmat suits, which in theory will provide some protection from this. This is also really low level. The same way that bananas can set off Geiger counters, this can too, but like snow is not typically radioactive, even not at minimal levels. Gotcha, gotcha. I just want to just be prepared. I am going to note down that there are trace levels of radiation. I guess on top of that, you also find faint but persistent X-ray and gamma radiation readings that are separate from the kind of fallout readings you're getting. Okay. Give me a science physics check. All right. Here's another go at that. Fucking online class doctorate. <laughs> we have another failure at 86%. All right. So looking at the map, you take readings that are roughly one kilometer and four kilometers respectively away from the lake itself. Just kind of use that as a focal point of this, given your other findings so far. And at one kilometer, the average hourly radioactivity is 0 0.09 MSV. And at four kilometers, it's 0 0.07 MSFV. Okay. Implying that the closer to the lake you get, the more it goes up. Okay. I might hold off on actually visiting the lake until I am properly equipped. Sure. With maybe some rad suits, just in case if there is a spike in radiation, I don't want to get caught in that. No, sure. And also, this all takes some time. Like This takes several hours to kind of get all of that. You're traveling around. It's snowy. Your escort, while helpful, isn't really helping you go about this. So, yeah, doing all this is going to take several hours. You're definitely kind of pushing late into the night, kind of. You push well past midnight just going about doing this. So, with that in mind. Yeah, I think after that, then, I'm getting these readings, especially if it's, like, well past midnight, I'm going. You're not done with this by any measure. Like, this will easily take, kind of, based on what you're looking at, probably six or so hours. Mm -hmm.